John Carpenter's 1982 sci-fi horror The Thing is widely regarded as a masterpiece of the genre. One aspect of the film's success is the score by Ennio Morricone, and director John Carpenter also contributed music to the film. But what makes the score to The Thing so convincing, and why does it have such an effect on the audience? In this video, I'm going to be analysing the prominent music cues used in the film. Let's do it. An interesting feature of the score to The Thing is that it has what's called a tonal centre. This is where one pitch is featured frequently throughout a piece of music, to the point where it is considered a home key. The overall tonal centre of the score is F. The main theme, sometimes nicknamed the heartbeat theme, is instantly recognisable. It's a simple one bar ostinato, consisting of two statements of a low F, one at the start of the bar and one at the end. It's an even more simplistic motif than the theme from Jaws. In the film, it's established that the thing has one simple goal, survival, a concept somewhat encapsulated in this ostinato as it reappears numerous times in key moments of the film. The silence that takes up the majority of the bar also puts the listener on edge. I don't know what the hell's in there, but it's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. However, before we go into more detail on the main theme, it's not in fact the first bit of music we hear in the film. The first cue is a gradual emergence of sound using exclusively synthesizer tones. It begins on a very quiet low F, and a soundscape lasting nearly two minutes grows out of this initial single pitch. The score you're looking at now is an approximation. The bar lines are just there for convenience, to show a passage of time passing and to demonstrate the entry of subsequent pitches more clearly. It's impossible to decide how this was notated, if indeed it was notated at all, so this is really an educated guess to illustrate what happens musically. We hear the note F in this low octave first, then in subsequent higher octaves. A new pitch enters D flat again in several octaves. The dynamics increase, and as they do, a third voice, much softer in the mix, enters. Note that the distance between F and D flat is a third. The interval of a third becomes more prominent as the film progresses. As that third voice enters, there's a massive crescendo, and at the peak of that crescendo, the D flat resolves to a C, producing a bare fifth chord. A more aggressive bass synth tone comes out of the texture briefly. before the F, D flat and C return in multiple octaves. We're then left with F octaves and these fade out gradually. This music also appears in shorter or slightly amended versions in other scenes. Sometimes the same notes are used, but they may appear in different octaves. Extra notes might be added. kidneys, liver, intestines. Or some notes are emitted, creating a thinner texture. Seem to be normal.
This is the first of many examples throughout the score where consistency is achieved by using the same musical ingredients several times, but with each appearance there is some modification of that material. The idea of a single pitch growing into several tones, reaching a climax, and then receding away again is used in several places in the film. It becomes a kind of motivic idea in itself. It's not a conventional setup of melody plus harmony, but more of a kind of sound gesture. This is a type of musical event where exact pitches are less important, and it's what happens to those pitches sonically that is the point of the music. So, if this introductory music happened to start on a note other than F, say A flat, it still achieved the same musical effect. This is a technique used by many contemporary classical composers and has become a staple of many horror film scores. The pitch F is retained throughout many passages of music in the film. When a fixed pitch is either held or played in a rhythm constantly in music, we call it a pedal point, or often simply pedal. The word drone can also be used. The term pedal comes from classical organ music, where composers would frequently require the player to hold down a note on the pedal board with their feet for several bars, whilst the hands play more busier parts on the keyboard. After the title card, the main theme is heard for the first time. A second ostinato, two bars in length, is played an octave higher over the first. This fills in some of the gaps in the middle of the bar created by the first ostinato. These two ostinati have a dual effect. Firstly, they represent the thing itself, an antagonistic threat ever present, ruthless in its pursuit. Secondly, it also depicts the bleak, unchanging and desolate environment in which the events of the film unfold. You reach anybody yet? Reach anybody? We're a thousand miles from nowhere, man, and it's going to get a hell of a lot worse before it gets any better. Next comes the more melodic material. Its sustained tones sharply contrast with the rather terse nature of the two ostinati in the bass. The melody is a three-bar phrase in two parts, played four times, creating a twelve-bar cycle. The top line uses just two notes, C and D flat, which are the same two pitches heard alongside the F during the film's opening credits. We can see that the lower line gradually moves away from the upper part. The intervals between the two lines gradually widen over the 12 bar section. When the 12 bars are repeated, the notes are doubled an octave higher. Let's put the notes in one octave on two staves to illustrate this more clearly. Here we can see the top voice is always fixed on a semitone between C and D flat. Whereas the lower voice moves down to a lower set of notes at the start of each three bar phrase. Notice how the intervals of the first two note chord in each phrase increases by one each time. And similarly, the second two note chord of each phrase also increases by one. All possible interval numbers from seconds to sevenths are used in this melody. So how can we interpret this theme when it's only made up of a few notes? Well, the top voice wavers from C to D flat, but never changes. This could represent the characters who we know are human by the time of the blood test scene. Whilst these characters have all avoided becoming victims of the thing up to this point, the use of an oscillating semitone in this line creates a questioning sense of unease. Both they and the audience are kept guessing as to who might be an imposter. Because we're going to find out who's the thing. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! The lower descending part could represent the characters that become imitations. They change into something far removed from their human counterparts, emphasised by the widening intervals. So how do we know who's human? Essentially this theme is a musical depiction of the growing mistrust amongst the group. What the hell are you looking at me like that for? I don't know. 
Not only is the thing infecting humans physically, but it has the side effect of the characters' trust for one another being worn away. Put that down. No, I'll put this right to your head. You guys gonna listen to Gary? You gonna let him give the orders? I mean, he could be one of those things! As the film progresses, arguments, altercations and outbursts become more prominent as the tension causes divides between the characters. Okay, Blair. Come on, man. You don't want to hurt anybody. Mentioning paranoia becomes unavoidable when discussing the thing. Nobody trusts anybody now. And this is gradually cranked up throughout the film in the same way that tension is created with the repetition of minimal musical ideas like the two ostinati from the main theme. I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch! Since the two-part melody is a three-bar phrase, the two-bar ostinato below it takes a while to line up again with the start of the next phrase. This type of misalignment again highlights the growing conflict and uncertainty that the characters experience. Child, what if we're wrong about him? Why then we're wrong? One important feature of the score is that the synth tones tend to be employed when the thing is the focus of a scene. Generally, if no imitation or attack occurs, and the humans are the main focus, we hear the familiar sounds of the orchestra. This must have been a conscious decision, as it really emphasises the stark opposition of human life, recognisable orchestral timbres, being pitted against the otherworldly sound of the synth which characterises the thing. Because it's different than us, see? The cue named Humanity Part 1 is first heard when MacReady and Copper head out to the Norwegian camp. This cue is more fragile sounding, using a repeated idea in the harp that suggests a sense of isolation. This idea uses four pitches, G, A-flat, C and D-flat. The harp figure consists of four pairs of semitones, which are then played in reverse order. Muted horns and piano discreetly colour these semitones, enhancing the dissonance. The theme is played gently on two clarinets, with the bassoon providing a brief answering phrase in its expressive upper register. The violins provide a more chromatic secondary melodic line on top of this. We then hear a low F in the cellos and double basses, which slowly wavers between F and E, another semitone, and again related to the upper voice of the main theme. As the violins descend, horns and trombones play the theme, creating a more ominous sound. Between each three-bar phrase, we hear isolated chords from the upper woodwinds and trumpets in the gaps. The music is working on many levels, yet is very simply constructed. If you listen very carefully, you can hear the synth faintly towards the end of this cue, although it is less obvious in the film. This cue is also heard when Blair runs his computer simulation. Blair's expression here is very minimal like the music, but it says so much. The next cue is a type of canon, which is the same melody heard in several voices, but each voice starts on a different note and at a different place in the bar. 
This canon is in three parts for strings. Here are the notes of each part of the canon. Each melody is the same shape, and the intervals between the pitches in each part are the same. They just start on a different note. Let's give each note a different colour, so it's clear how the voices copy each other. Now let's see this arranged in full score. The top and bottom voices are in octaves. The middle line is not doubled in octaves. Instead, the piano, used in its neutral, cool-sounding middle register, reinforces the viola line by repeating the notes, producing a kind of slow delay effect with the sustaining string timbre, which adds to the atmosphere. The idea of using a canon, a musical device of which the main feature is imitative melody, is a nod and subtle warning of the thing's ability to copy other life forms. This type of writing is called imitative texture. Deliberately arrhythmic, this canon emphasizes the unknown as MacReady and Copper continue their investigation. My God, what the hell happened here? It is interesting that such a historic compositional technique was used for this cue. Canons have been around for centuries and used in pretty much every period of classical music. If we group the notes of each canon entry on one stave and arrange them as a chord, we can see that each group produces an augmented triad. In the canon, however, the notes of these triads are spread out and played at different speeds so that they overlap, creating new dissonances as the canon progresses. The canon is then repeated a third higher, Then, when Mac and Copper find the ice block, the violins play a searching theme, wandering and ascending into the higher register. Note that this line contains many semitones. Then the second violins and violas enter, and for the first time in the score we have a completely contrapuntal texture in three parts. Contrapuntal means there are several melodies happening at once. This is a very common feature of classical music, used frequently by all well-known composers from J.S. Bach through to Stravinsky and beyond. However, a fully contrapuntal texture is not that common in film scores, so this is quite a striking moment in the soundtrack. The second violins play a long descending chromatic scale. The violas also play a chromatic line, but it is a mixture of rising and falling notes, and they are not always a semitone apart. The first violin's line climbs a few semitones, drops by a larger interval, then climbs up again, then drops once more. This sense of pulling down shifts the harmonies lower and lower until they converge briefly on a G minor chord in second inversion. Again, note how these three lines are related in that they use similar ideas, but these ideas are employed in slightly different ways to generate interest. The cellos and basses play a short melodic idea with a stop-start quality that again rises chromatically in semitones. This will be featured later on. The upper strings notes slowly move together until a cluster is formed, with each note being a semitone apart. When the remains are brought back to the camp, the second higher canon from earlier returns. thirds reappear again, once more overlapping in the strings. Each pair of these thirds is a semitone lower than the last entry. This passage is very chromatic. It's giving importance to the uncharted territory the characters find themselves in. There's not much dialogue here, because the music aptly conveys what everyone is thinking. The dense descending chords almost melt downwards like the face of the body they're examining. The 
These chords are formed by several major triads being superimposed on top of each other, a technique known as polytonality, which literally means many keys. This was popular in 20th century classical music. Here we have three triads, E flat major, G major, and B minor. When we get to this polytonal chord, the double basses quietly move around E and F in their lowest octave. There really is a comprehensive level of cohesion in the score. Such simple ideas like the use of semitones and thirds could sound quite predictable and, dare I say, cheesy in the wrong hands, but Morricone uses these intervals in very fresh and original ways. The reveal of the thing in the dog kennel is a real key moment in the film, but there is no grandiose orchestral outburst. It's just that same low F drone on the synthesizer, which is very effective since it really focuses our attention and doesn't distract us. And when MacReady shines his torch on the thing, it's not just looking back at him and the other characters, it's looking right at the audience too. During the autopsy of the dog thing's remains, again we only hear the orchestra because the focus is on the humans and their reaction to what's happened. After some brief counterpoint from the strings, the piccolo this time has a short solo, a fresh alternative sound to the high violin melodies heard earlier. The supporting harmonies move out of kilter with the melody and the bass line, which is quite disorientating. Once we reach this A minor chord, there is a quiet timpani solo, which is significant because there is really not much percussion in this score at all. Very unusual for a horror film. The trumpet plays a few repeated middle Cs. Then we hear descending chords in the strings. Note again how they are either a third or a semitone apart. There is another change of harmony from F minor to D minor. As the violins are then left on a lone A. The trumpet and horns then play chromatic ascending triads. The overall key here is A minor. Low bassoons, horns and strings close the scene as Blair finds the dog partly assimilated. This is quite a bleak sound that would not be out of place in a symphony by a composer such as Mahler or Tchaikovsky. Later on, when MacReady and his colleagues fly out to the site where the spaceship was found, we hear string trills. This can be seen as a development of the semitone idea, since these trills are always played to the closest possible note to the written pitch. These trills are stacked on top of each other, producing a very dense atonal cluster. I interpret this to be depicting the unforgiving, harsh, oppressive wind of the Antarctic, always in the background, and in a funny sort of way it also complements the helicopter's rotor blade sound. Here the vastness of the Antarctic landscape is depicted in a more symphonic manner. To me this is somewhat similar to the English composer Vaughan Williams' Seventh Symphony, nicknamed Symphonia Antarctica, where a large orchestra is used to describe the enormous expanses of ice and glaciers. The style is very different to the Thing soundtrack, but the same picture is drawn in the listener's mind. A new, slithery idea appears in the low brass and strings,
it's entirely made up of sevenths moving in parallel motion. The seventh is the widest interval heard at the end of the main theme's melody, so we have another connection between old and new material. Within this texture we hear a sustained pedal E on muted horn. Note that the trills have gradually ascended throughout this passage. The seventh idea then converges on an A in several octaves. The violins are left hanging on to a high A before continuing with another wandering melody, whilst below there is a rising chromatic scale in triads, played by the low strings, bassoons and piano. The addition of the piano in its low register here thickens the texture and adds an almost doom-laden quality to the chords. This C in the trumpet gradually becomes more insistent and is effectively another pedal tone. The music then quickly increases in intensity, with the violin slowly climbing upwards once more whilst the bass line slowly descends. This is called contrary motion, where two parts move in opposite direction to each other. We then reach the only time when we really hear the orchestra at its loudest, brass and strings dominating with two chords, F minor followed by A minor. Once more we find two chords, separated by the distance of a third. Whilst the F minor chord is firmly in root position, feeling very solid and grounded, the A minor chord on the other hand is in a weaker second inversion. The A minor second inversion chord sounds significantly more unstable coming after the stronger F minor chord. This could highlight how paranoia has now upset the previous stability within the camp. Also, the characters have uncovered a bit more information regarding their situation, but struggle to fully understand what is playing out before them. I just cannot believe any of this voodoo bullshit. When Bennings is assimilated, a new synth tone is used, this time modified with filters and having a more processed quality. Here, the tonal centre is E, but F is still present within the texture. The cluster harmonies return, this time using all natural notes in various octaves. The music combines notes that form a scale rather than grouping semitones together. These are called diatonic clusters. Diatonic harmony uses notes that could be said to belong to a recognisable key or scale. An easy way to demonstrate this is by playing lots of natural notes close together on the piano at the same time. Or lots of sharps and flats together at the same time. These diatonic cluster chords produced by the synth are less dissonant than the previous chromatic clusters, but are still unsettling in this scene, as the notes gradually build into another thick mass of sound.
Later in the scene with Fuchs in the lab, a similar cue is heard. This time the focus is on F again, and the pitch E flat clashes with this F. The jump scare here also uses the pitch F, but in a higher octave to the drone for contrast. This tone has a completely different quality to it, which starts loud and is cut off abruptly instead of growing from silence. Similar to the cue used for the assimilation of Bennings, this is another type of diatonic cluster chord which fades until we hear just F and E flat in the same octave. and during Blair's attack on Gary near the end of the film, the same jump scare is used. At the reveal of the Blair thing, we hear the synth and orchestra together. The orchestral sound is strings playing pizzicato, divided into many parts, producing a very atonal and unsynchronised harmony. After the camp has been blown up, without any musical accompaniment, the humanity cue and harp figure return, as we see that just Childs and Mac are left. You the only one who made it? Not the only one. Suspicion is apparent right to the end. Where were you, Childs? The music now takes on a much darker meaning, as MacReady and Childs seemingly become resigned to their fate, both appearing to accept that it is futile to remain in such a state of mistrust. Why don't we just wait here for a little while, see what happens. The main theme then starts up, leading to the credits. The ending of The Thing is surely one of the most discussed endings in cinema history. Is Childs a Thing? Does Mac know? I may as well give my opinion here, as I have the chance. I believe both Childs and Mac are human. However, from what others, including John Carpenter, have said since, we probably won't ever know for sure. That's the point though. It's fun to have this mystery which allows for different interpretations, and it'll still be debated for many years to come. When the credits play, the theme cycles around many times. At each new repetition, the melodic lines are doubled an octave higher. On the fifth repetition, a new element is introduced. We hear a different version of the theme for the first time, starting on different notes and at a different point in the bar. What the hell for? It's another type of canon. A new eerie layer of sound sits on top of the music that we've become familiar with.
final two notes in this new additional part are then held over after this phrase finishes, producing an F minor chord. We then hear the 12 bar cycle a few more times before each element starts to drop out, leaving just the two ostinati and the drone. The drone then drops out. Then the upper ostinato. And finally we come full circle and the heartbeat theme is heard a few times, completely on its own. The fact that nearly 40 years after its release, people are still discussing the film is a testament to both John Carpenter's direction and also Bill Lancaster's screenplay and why so many people enjoy the film on so many levels. Despite this, Morricone's score was actually nominated for a Razzie for Worst Score. You gotta be fucking kidding. The music for The Thing is a wonderful example of real economy and restraint in a film score. The absence of music in some key scenes makes it all the more effective when it reappears and the action on screen becomes more terrifying as a result. <laughs> Using the same cue in more than one scene, far from being lazy, is an ingenious touch because it links those scenes together, one being the cause of the other, or perhaps they have similar messages to convey. I believe this raises the film above just being another generic monster movie or horror film with another very generic sounding score. The Thing has a mixture of horror, sci-fi, psychological thriller, and mystery, and the music reflects all of those different moods yet is constructed from a very small number of ideas. Great. The stripped down nature of the music, its extensive yet varied use of a limited number of cues, and the effective juxtaposition of dense orchestral textures against the naked, uncompromising synthesizer sounds, creates a unique and compelling score that makes The Thing one of the most notable and celebrated horror films of all time. So, do you have a favourite part of the score? Let me know in the comments below, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Until then, this is Dan the Feud Guy, signing out.